This video is part of the Leadership Dream Job series, where I watch documentaries about world leaders on Magellan TV and share what I learned with you. Today's episode covers the Battle of El Alamein. Enjoy. Throughout time, great duels have marked turning points in our history. The most interesting clashes happen when the underdog comes out on top and they inspire a whole generation of dreamers. And they get enormous royalties from Disney for the movie rights. This is not that story. Hi, I'm Kasha Patel. Today, I'm gonna to talk about World War II. And spoiler alert, Germany lost. Because this is a science YouTube channel, I'm going to tell you how science won the war. That's the atomic bomb exploding at Nagasaki. No, 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 not that science, not that science. Nice science, nice science. Better. In particular, I'm talking about the Second Battle of El Alamein in 1942, where the British defeated the German army. When we think of war, we think it's won by who has the best armor and the best weapons. But in reality, infectious diseases play a huge part in weakening troops. It's sometimes even called the Third Army. Circumstances were no different here, at least on the German side. Here's some background info. In 1941, German leader Adolf Hitler sent General Erwin Rommel to North Africa to grab control of the oil fields in the Middle East. Rommel and his Italian ally would have to fight through Libya and Egypt through the British forces to get to those oil fields. Rommel was known to be a great general. Because of his bold and surprise attacks, he was actually known as the Desert Fox, which is also what I call my dog at the beach. Rommel was well respected by both sides, the Germans and the opposing forces. He was almost like a folk hero which really annoyed some of the British leadership. One British general even wrote a memo forbidding people to use Rommel's name. I wish to dispel by all possible means the idea that Rommel represents something more than an ordinary German general. The important thing now is that we do not always talk of Rommel when we mean the enemy in Libya. We must refer to the Germans or the Axis powers or the enemy and not always keep harping on Rommel. P.S. I am not jealous of Rommel. That, folks, is a real memo with no editing done by me, surprisingly. Even Winston Churchill showed respect for Rommel. You remember Churchill. He was the leader of England. He kind of looks like a Pillsbury Doughboy if the character was filled with alcohol and a sense of war. <laughs> Anyways, Churchill went to North Africa and said, Oh, hell no! Rommel is a military genius, and we need someone new on our side. Enter Bernard Montgomery. Montgomery is not well known when he is picked to lead the British at El Alamein. He is confident he's up to the job, but Churchill is less sure. He was the sort of person, if you got him into an argument, he would be like a terrier. He would go at it until he'd made his point and made certain he'd won his point. Some say the battle was a numbers game, which it was. Montgomery's troops nearly doubled Rommel's. But the numbers are actually worse than they appear because not even all of Rommel's troops were in great health. Sick rates among Rommel's soldiers are almost triple those of Montgomery's men. What gives the British this huge advantage? Toilets. The loo, the john, the dunny, the ivory throne, where I take all of my Zoom calls. Ideally, you dig this as deep as you can get it, so you've got waste well down because it's going to start filling up pretty quickly. Almost ready for use. Tack that on, the flies can't get in. The British learned from previous battles that proper sanitation is very important. They even hired hygiene officers to make sure everything was clean and purify water supplies. Rommel, our desert fox, did not have time to make toilets or have proper sanitation. They were always on the move, relying on quick and fast movements. 
the Africa Corps would go off and indiscriminately poo in the desert and come back. That brings flies, they land on your food, very rapidly you got dysentery. Estimates say one out of five Germans were listed as sick during the battle. Common illnesses were fever, dysentery, diarrhea, hepatitis, skin and soft tissue damages, and gastroenteritis. If you're experiencing any of these conditions, you may want to seek a better, more hygienic army. Ask your country if Montgomery's army is right for you. A UK sanitation report also states that proper hygiene probably helped them win the battle. Even Rommel got sick with stomach and liver issues. He needed to take medical leave, but he couldn't because they're in the middle of a battle and they're losing. Rommel's army also had terrible food. You know, chow, grub, forages, what I have on my Zoom calls. With food in increasingly short supply, Rommel's German and Italian troops are eating a diet with little variety. a and M, Alimento Militare. A mysterious the... meat product. Absolutely. The Germans had nicknames for it. Um, they called it Alta Man, meaning the old man, and the Italians uh, referred to it as uh, Mussolini's ass. Oh, right. um, and then with it, we've got hardtack biscuits. <laughs> Uh, they'll never go rotten, they're really uh, pretty durable. Yeah. In fact, the Germans call them cement plates. <laughs> I think you've just dented the steel. The British ate a lot better. Ironic, right? They had meat and vegetables. Those hygiene officers we talked about before actually made sure there was enough food and came up with new methods for cooking. Really good, full of protein, yeah. give you bags of energy. And then the vegetables, you've got what, beans, peas, carrots, yeah. potato. That's vitamin C right there. Yeah. And fiber, I enjoyed that. So even for Rommel's troops that were alive, they had a terrible diet and were probably pretty angry. Lastly, the British also had better medical treatment during the battle. Take, for instance, blood transfusions. Both sides used them, but the Germans didn't have a very efficient method. Most battlefield casualties die within 30 minutes, but the German blood transfusion system is slow and cumbersome. The operator would put a needle into the donor's vein, connect this via a syringe into a needle into the recipient's vein, and then the operator would suck blood out of the donor, turn the tap round, squeeze it into the recipient, turn the tap round, very time consuming, and of course it required donors pulling chaps out of the line instead of shooting the British. The British had a much more efficient method. They didn't need live donors. Specifically, one major sent his men out to the streets of Cairo to pick up old beer bottles. They sanitized them and used them for blood. You could put the needle into the recipient, hold up the bottle or hang it onto a tree or whatever, and let the blood run through. See, in fact, you could have a row of patients, 20, 30 people, for wounds caused by landmines or grenades, the British also learned to suture them up really fast. They were also using better medicine, like antiseptics and penicillin. Even though penicillin was discovered decades earlier, it was actually first administered to US troops in North Africa in 1942. For cases that were thought to be almost always fatal, penicillin reduced the mortality rate to 20%. In the end, Rommel retreated with very few troops and against Hitler's order. And for Montgomery, he delivered the first real British win in World War II. He is one of the most decorated generals in the war. Churchill was so ecstatic and rang the church bells for the first time in three years since World War II began. We the best. If you enjoyed this content, subscribe to my YouTube channel for more funny science videos.